how would you define church? When I say church, what do you think of? Do you think of a, a place to gather? Do you think of a place to worship? Do you think of a place to hear God's voice? Do you think of a place to hear God's word? Do you think of a group? Do you think of a group of people, family, a body? What do you think of when you think of church? This thing we do called church. Do you think of acceptance? Do you think of rejection? Do you think of joy? Unspeakable and full of glory? Or do you think of struggle and strife and hurt and pain? What, what do you think about when you think of this thing we call church? Over the next several weeks, we are going to take a journey through the book of Ephesians. And we're going to examine this thing we call church. And along the way, we're going to answer a few more questions. How do we love Jesus deeper? How do we worship God authentically? How do we worship our Savior, Jesus? How do we, how do we move in the gifts of the Holy Spirit through the power of Jesus? How do we bring Jesus into our families to impact our families? How, how do we bring Jesus into where we live, where we work? How do we make this thing called church all about Jesus? Brookie and I love Jersey Mike's. We love Jersey Mike's. I would dare say that for her and I at lunchtime, that's our happy place. <clears throat> she gets a ham and provolone. It's a number three. She gets lettuce and mayonnaise. And I get a number 13, which is an original Italian. I get it Mike's way. And then I add mayonnaise and hot pepper relish. It's our happy place, man. We love it there. Yes, it's a shameful plug in advertisement. If you've not been there, please go. If you've never had a sub there, or maybe you have, and, and you get it Mike's way. Mike's way is lettuce and onions and tomatoes and oil and vinegar and spices. That's Mike's way. And so when Jewel, what, Jewel, so when Brookie and I go there, we, we get our subs and we love Jersey Mike's, but we don't quite get it Mike's way. Brookie kind of stops short right before, because she, she stops at lettuce and I kind of take all of Mike's way, and then I add to it to make it the way that I want it. It's not that that's necessarily bad. It's just that the farther you get away from Mike's way, either by getting less of his way or adding to his way, the less it becomes Mike's way. And that is what I've been wrestling with in this thing we call church. When we think about church God's way, do we stop short of embracing all that he intended? There's things that are in scripture, that are biblical, that are, that are part of this thing we call church, but we stop short because it makes us uncomfortable. How many of you know when the Holy Spirit moves, it can be uncomfortable? We just kind of, we just, it's just uncomfortable. So we don't, we don't quite, we don't quite go there. Or maybe we take what God intended and we add to it because he didn't quite do it right. And so we want to improve on this thing. And really what we really want to do is just make it more like the church that we, we want to, we want to go to. We, we want to make this thing called church what we want it to be. So we take what he intended it to be and we kind of add to it. And see, none of those things in and of themselves are necessarily wrong. 
It's just the more that we stay away from what he intended and the more we add to what he intended, the less it is like God's way. I think that most of us would agree that this thing called church is not a building. It's not a building. It's not an address. It's not an organization either. Church. People. People. It's you, it's me, it's us, it's people. The bride of Christ is not a building. The bride of Christ are people. So when we start talking about this thing called church, then we've got to start talking about what makes up the church, which is us, people. So that's where we start. When we start defining this thing called church, when we start looking at how God does church and how we do church, and we want to, we want to make sure that we're doing church his way, right? That, that would be a, that would be, yeah. <laughs> just in case you're confused, we want to do church God's way because God's way is perfect. So when we start talking about church and what we're afraid to kind of step into or what we've added to it to change it the way that we want it to be, what I start to wonder is, are we getting away from how God initially wanted church to share the love and the gospel of Jesus. Are we getting away from that? Is it uncomfortable to preach Jesus in church? Is it uncomfortable? Because part of the gospel is what? Sin. Without it, you go to hell. Do you believe that, Donnie? Yes, I do. I don't know about your Bible, but my Bible talks a whole lot more about hell where you don't want to go than to heaven where you do want to go. Why? Because you don't want to go to hell. But that's uncomfortable. So I wonder, are we, are we taking church and are we taking this thing called church and are we watering it down? To, are we changing it to make it fit more applicable into our world and our society and getting away from what God really intended? For example, God intended the Holy Spirit to move in church. The Holy Spirit is actually in you and moves where you are when you are. Where you are, when you are, is when the Holy Spirit moves. He certainly should be able to move in church. Can I tell you something else? This is a little bit of a side note, but I just got to tell you. The, the Holy Spirit is not some less than part of the Trinity. He's not an afterthought. Without the Holy Spirit... Christ is still in the grave. It was by God's spirit that he raised Jesus from the dead. And I love this part. I say this all the time. That same spirit, that Holy Spirit lives in us. So when we start talking about this thing called church and we start talking about doing church God's way, the Holy Spirit has to be a part of that. And it has to come out of us because we are the church. So we're going to answer two questions over the next several weeks. Number one, what is God's way? And number two, how do we do church God's way? And we're going to begin where the Apostle Paul began with one of the primary keys of church. Grace. Grace. Would you pray with me this morning? Father God, thank you. Thank you for your word. Pierce our hearts with it this morning, Lord, that we leave here changed. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Where book are we going to be in this morning? Oh, you all are listening. I love you all. Let's get to Ephesians. 
Now, this was a pop, this is a pop quiz. What chapter are we going to be in? What? What? You are fantastic. I love you guys. Ephesians 1. Okay, here's a tough one. What verse? One. All right, I'll leave you alone. Ephesians 1, 1. Open your Bibles, take out your favorite app, look over my shoulder. Here we go. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, to the faithful saints in Christ Jesus at Ephesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3, blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who was blessed, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ. For he chose us in him before the foundations of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him. Verse 5, he predestined us to be adopted as sons through Christ, through Jesus Christ, for himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he lavished on us in the beloved one. Verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he richly poured out on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he purposed in Christ. Verse 10. As a plan for the right time to bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven. I think my... Notes got a little messed up there. Forgive me. Let's start in verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, to the faithful saints in Christ Jesus at Ephesus, grace to you, peace from, our, peace from, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3. Blessed, listen to this, blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ. Let that sit for a minute. Through Jesus, because of Jesus, in Jesus, through Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Through Jesus, God is now your Father, your Heavenly Father. And He has blessed us. That word, yulio, is Greek. It says honoring, acting kindly. Honoring, acting kindly towards. With every spiritual blessing, that word blessing is elugio, which, also mean, which is also Greek, which means generous gift. In the heavens, in Christ. I'll let that sit for a minute. Every spiritual blessing has been given to you through Christ Jesus. God has honored you. He's, he's, he's blessed you with good gifts. At what point did you deserve it? At what point did I deserve it? That's why it's called grace. Do you understand that out of love, through Jesus, God became your father, your heavenly father. And he's given you every good blessing, every spiritual blessing. Listen, it doesn't mean you're not going to go through hard times. It doesn't mean you're not going to suffer. It doesn't mean you're not going to struggle. But what it means is that you have every blessing given to you by your heavenly father to go through those storms, to struggle, to, to, to be on the other side of them because he walks with you. He goes with you. Every spiritual blessing. Look at verse 4. For he chose us in him before the foundations of the world to be holy and blameless 
in love before him. It says he chose us in him before, in him, Jesus, before the foundations of the world. It means before he created the world, he chose that you and I would be able to stand in his presence holy and blameless. When was the last time you were holy and blameless? When was the last time I was holy and blameless? Before God even breathed the stars, before he even created the earth, he determined that we would be holy and blameless and, ever to, and be able to be in his presence again. Because of love. Because of love. He predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself. Verse 5, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he lavished on us in the beloved one. He predestined us. That word predestined gets a lot of press in theology. There are um, teachings that what predestination means is that God got out of bed, created the world, and decided, okay, so, um, Bonnie, you're going to go to heaven. Fran, you were really close, but just didn't quite make the cut. Really close. Daniel, don't even get me started. <laughs> Tracy, you know, yeah, you know, heaven just wouldn't be the same without her, so we definitely want Tracy. Hmm, boy, this is a hard decision. Eeny, meeny, miny. It's like, it's like God decided ahead of time who would go to heaven and who would go to hell. That's predestination. But that's not accurate. And I'm going to give you three reasons why that is false theology. Number one, that completely removes human will. Because if God already decided, that means you can't decide. It's already been decided for you. Your will means nothing as a human being, which we know that's not biblical. If it wasn't for human will, none of us would have fallen in the first place. We have a choice. We can choose to receive what Jesus did for us on the cross, or we can choose to ignore it and pay for our sins ourselves. We have a choice. There's a human will. Here's the second reason. Nowhere in God's word does predestination connect with or is used for non-believers. Whenever the term predestination is used, it is always used in relation to believers. God did not decide who would go and who would not. We decide that by making the choice. But here's what predestination, here's the other thing that predestination doesn't mean. In the context of predestination in God's word, he didn't predestine who would go to hell and who would go to heaven. He predestined, did predetermined, predecided. Listen to this. That even though we would fall, even though we would fall, even though we would be born into sin, even though that we would be sinful before we were even made, knowing we would fall, he predecided that he would send his son to die on Calvary so that you and I could once again stand in the presence of a holy God and be adopted into his family. He predecided he would do that knowing we would fall. And he made us anyway. Knowing he would come and die for us, he made us. Predetermining. That while we would be imperfect, he would come and perfectly save us. You know what predestination is about? You know what, you know what verse 5 is about? Love. Love. 
God loved us so much. God loved you so much. Jesus loved you so much that before you were even a thought, before the earth was even spoken into existence, he said, I will go and I will lay my life down for them so that even though they fall, our relationship, our relationship can be restored. And I want to spend eternity with them. That's predestination. That's the, the God of love determining to make us anyway, knowing he would come and die for us. I don't know. That's just overwhelming to me. That's just, I, I, you start thinking about that and you bring that into your humanity and you start thinking like, yeah, I wouldn't do that. I'd find another way. Or I create something else. I'm not going to create something that I have to come and die for. But he did that because of how much he loves us. So when did you deserve that? When did I deserve to have a God love me that much? When did I earn it? When did you earn it? That's why it's called grace. Receiving something that you don't deserve. Look at verse 7. It says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. That word trespasses is interpreted as sins, according to the riches of his grace that he richly poured out on us with all wisdom and understanding. If you have accepted Jesus as your Savior, you have been redeemed. Have you ever heard that word, redeemed? It literally means to buy back. To buy back at a high cost. It's literally what that means. So when Paul says... In him, we have redemption through his blood. In other words, Jesus laid his life down, shed his blood so that you and I could be redeemed, bought back from the evil one to once again be in the presence of a holy God. No one made him do it. Do you understand? No one made Jesus do that. Jesus came and died for you. He died for me to redeem us back because he wanted to, to forgive so that our sins could be forgiven according to his riches, according to the riches of his grace that he richly poured out. Another translation says he lavishly poured out on us with all wisdom and understanding. He knew what he was doing. Don't you understand? Jesus came and died for your sins, for my sins. And he was well aware and knew what he was doing. He was redeeming us back. That has to change how we do church. Come on. It's got to change how we see people. Especially the annoying ones. Can I break it to you? Sometimes you're them. Sometimes you're annoying. Not Joel, but everybody else. No, we, 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 we are the people that we despise at times. We behave just like them. But we have been redeemed. God came for us. So when we do church his way, it has to include grace. What is grace? Grace is receiving something that you don't deserve. How do you give grace? You give grace by giving someone something they don't deserve. I once heard a pastor say that when we receive grace, we want to hear a beep sound. Beep, 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 as that enormous earth-moving dump truck backs up over us and just piles grace on. That's what we want to hear. Just this immense amount of grace, receiving what I don't deserve, Lord. But when we hand it out, 
we look for one of those little teaspoons. I don't mean the big teaspoon. I mean the little teaspoon that English people use to stir their tea. That's why. And then we put just a couple of grains, and as soon as it falls off, we're like, that's enough. You got all the grace you're getting for me today. So we got we to gotta do church differently because we've been redeemed. Here's something else I have to tell you. This is really important. Listen to me. Redemption means you've been paid for. It means you've been bought back. It means that you no longer belong to you. You no longer belong to you. Jesus Christ laid his life down to redeem you back from the Father. I mean, redeem you back to the Father. And you are no longer your own. That means that every single decision that you make or that I make must be made along with God's word, along with prayer, along with seeking the Lord. Lord, is this what you want me to do? Because you've been redeemed. You no longer belong to you. That means that what you decide to do has to be based on what he wants you to do. Isn't that just full of joy? It's hard. I'm not saying this is easy. This is difficult stuff. But this is what we're called to be as the church, full of grace, redeemed by a Savior who came willingly to die for us. That now we don't belong to ourselves. We belong to him, and we are better for it. Mm, mm, mm. Verse 9, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he purposed in Christ as a plan for the right time to bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and things on earth in him. I could have skipped these two verses. I could have. But here's why I didn't. Because God's timing is perfect. And that's what this says. It says it in his good pleasure that he purposed, he decided in Christ as a plan for the right time. For the right time. You've heard me say this before but it's the best analogy that I have. When is an apple ripe? An apple is ripe when it is ripe. That is God's timing. God's timing is perfect. It is exactly the right time. Jesus came at exactly the right time in the world to be born 2,000 years ago to be able to accomplish what he needed to accomplish. I don't want to be too graphic, but I just want to make a point. We have capital punishment, right? When is there bloodshed? Unless you count a, count a, a bad needle prick, never. But what washed away our sins? The blood of Jesus. God's timing is perfect. I don't understand it all, which is why it says, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he purposed in Christ as a plan for the right time to bring everything together in Christ. Without Jesus Christ, there is no church. There's no point of church. Everything that we do must be centered on the gospel of Jesus, all of it. When you serve someone because you're in first impressions, you are serving them as Jesus served. When you do kitchen hospitality, you're serving as Jesus served. When you're teaching children's church, you're teaching as Jesus taught, come to me, little ones. Let me share with you the kingdom of God. When you preach... You're preaching the gospel of Jesus. When we speak of love, we're not talking about human love. We're talking about agape. We're talking about the love of Jesus. Everything that we do in this thing called church has to be centered on Jesus. Now listen, we've already talked about this. The church is not this. The church is us. 
That means that everything that we do must be centered on the gospel of Jesus. Without Jesus, there is no us. We're going to hell. With Jesus, we go to heaven. We live. We're alive in Christ Jesus. In him we have also received, verse 11, an inheritance. Because we were predestined, there's that word again, according to the plan of the one who works out everything in agreement with the purpose of his will. So that we who had already put our hope in Christ might bring praise to his glory. Because of Christ, we receive an inheritance. Now, what do you have to be to receive an inheritance? You have to be an heir. Pastor Dave talked about this a few weeks ago. We are heirs to God. We're part of his family. We receive an inheritance. Because God wanted it that way. He predecided that he would make us heirs. That we would have access. That we would be his children. That we would be adopted in. That, and, and works out everything in agreement with the purpose of his will. It's what God wanted to do. You were not a mistake. I don't care what someone has told you in your life. You were not an accident. God loves you and predetermined that before you were even a thought that he would send Christ to die on a cross so that you could come and know him and be in the presence of a holy God and live day after day here until you're with him face to face in the glory and the outstanding blessing, spiritual blessings of the father. So that we who had already put our hope in Christ might bring praise to his glory. That we might bring praise to his glory, those that already know him. Are there any Christians in this building? I think I heard three. Are there any Christians in this building? That's all right. If there's only three of you, that just means I got a lot of work to do. I'm okay with that. Let me tell you something. If you're a Christian, you've got a story to share. And that's what Paul is saying. That might bring, that put our hope in Christ might bring praise to his glory. That we praise the Lord. How do we praise Jesus? How do we bring glory to his name? By sharing our story so that someone else can come to know him. How many of you have been saved by grace? <laughs> right? It's the only way you can be saved. It's through grace. That's why they call it grace, because we don't deserve to be saved. We deserve judgment, and we don't get what we deserve. That's called mercy. By the way, I'm just going to just, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but this is so important. You are not in a place to give mercy. You are not in a place as a church, as a person, as a Christian to give mercy. Because in order to give mercy, you have to be the one that judges whether or not it is right or it is wrong. That is the Lord's job. He gives mercy. Because we deserve death and he gives us life. But grace, you can give grace. You can give someone something they don't deserve. Want to get real for a minute? Your meal is extremely late, and the waitress could care less. She's extremely rude. Does she deserve a tip? Does she deserve your kindness? Does she deserve a smile? Should you give it to her anyway? I don't know, Donnie. That's kind of pushing it. See, you give grace because you've received grace. And that's how we do church God's way. And by the way, church is not a, it's a, 
So where you go is where the church of Jesus goes. You see how this is working together? Is anybody in here uncomfortable? Yeah, because you're not, you've bypassed the waitress. You're thinking about your own place, your own world, things that have come into your life where you're like, yeah, that person or this situation, you know, no. But we are called to give grace because we have been given grace. Verse 13 says, in him, you also were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believe, the Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. When you accepted Jesus as Savior, the Holy Spirit came to live inside of you. Your spirit and his spirit became one. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And it became the down payment on your inheritance because at that moment you became an heir to the Lord. You became an heir to heaven when you took the Lord's sacrifice for your sins, for your payment. You took that payment for your sins and now you have received the Holy Spirit as a down payment of an inheritance that one day you will recoup, you will receive when you go to heaven. But it says the Holy Spirit is the down payment. Can I offer to you that the Lord, if we're paying attention, will give us little glimpses of heaven through the Holy Spirit? You ever seen a newborn baby? My wife loves that smell. Newborn baby smell. You ever seen somebody healed? You ever seen a marriage put back together? Have you ever ever experienced joy in the middle of struggle and storm that just makes no sense? That is the Holy Spirit in us as a down payment of what we will experience for all of eternity. Today. Those little glimpses. This isn't in there, but I think the reason that he does that is so we don't lose hope. We get just little glimpses of heaven, and it's going to be okay. We encourage one another. That's a part of being a church. We bear one another's burdens. We encourage one another through the power of the Holy Spirit in us as a down payment of what we will receive one day in heaven. I'm really excited about that. (laughs) That I get to walk with the Spirit of God, that you get to walk with the Spirit of God. I don't have to do this thing called life by myself, not because I'm working and doing so good or made great decisions, because Lord knows that's not true. It's because of grace in my life. It's grace in your life. Freely given, lavishly poured out. There was this lady, Hetty Green. Died in 1916. She left an estate of about $100 million. In today's world, that's about $2 billion. I wrote it down. Yeah, about $2 billion in today's money. She's known as America's greatest miser. She ate cold oatmeal because it cost money to heat the water. Disputed, but her son ended up losing his leg because she was looking for a free clinic. She actually died of an apoplexy arguing with her maid over the cost of skim milk. $100 million. You know, even if it's not $2 billion, $100 million is quite a bit of money. Two billion dollars of today. Left it all. Didn't use it, didn't do anything with it, just amassed it. And then left this world. 
Now, Mr. Feeney, Charles F. Feeney, says that he was a, I wrote this down, it says, he was a pioneer of duty-free shops and a shrewd investor in technology startups. He gave away nearly $8 billion of his fortune before he died in 2023. To the point that he sold his Learjet, he sold his limousines. I just found it funny that there was actually an S on the end of limousine. <laughs> sold it all. He, he lived in a very modest apartment until the day of his death. Took the subway. Lived in uh, San Francisco. Took the subway. Modest way. He was worth five, eight billion dollars. And that's what he gave away. His last donation, 2016, his last donation of $7 million to his alma mater, Cornell University, um, for student uh, community service work, he officially emptied his Atlantic philanthropics, uh, philan philanthropies, sorry, philanthropies accounts, emptied them out to fulfill his pledge that he would give all of his wealth away before he died. Here's what I find so interesting about those two very different perspectives. One was to just hold on to it and 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 hold on to it. And eventually, everybody else got it anyway. And she never got to see that or enjoy that. But can you imagine the joy that Charles Feeney had watching billions of dollars bless people. My words, not his words, but bless people. Do work. He got to see it. He got to experience it. As Christians, we are blessed beyond measure. Every spiritual blessing, we are blessed with grace that you can't even, if you're listening to half of what Paul wrote about, you can't even wrap your head around that kind of grace, that kind of love that we have been just lavishly blessed with. We are rich beyond measure, but too many times we live as paupers, misers. We hold on to it. Well, they don't deserve it. They've hurt me. They don't deserve it. I'm not forgiving them. I don't, they don't deserve it. I'm holding on to it. I'm having a bad day. I want everybody else to have a bad day. Stop smiling. I'm not smiling. Just going through life bitter and angry. And for what? We have been given so much. Listen, if you're not saved, I get it. There's a lot to be miserable about. The world is coming apart. And you've got no hope. I understand that. But if we're saved by grace with such lavish love, how can we not give it away? How can we be misers with God's grace? If we are going to do church God's way, then we have to be willing to give grace away. We have to be willing to serve other people. We have to be willing to bless other people. Why? Because that's God's way. How do you know? Paul said so. Paul shared with us through, through incredible writing to the church of Ephesus saying, look, this is what God has done because of his great love for you. He has lavishly poured out his grace on you. You and I are called to give away what God has given to us so unselfishly. And I want to close with this. It's really not ours in the first place because it is, we have been bought with redemption. We have been bought with the blood of Christ. So if you'll just allow me, we have no right to hold it. Our only expression of such love and such grace is, God, here am I, send me. What can I do? How can I help? How can I be a blessing? How can I be kind today? How can I be generous today? That's, that's church, God's way. 
Would you stand with me this morning? You can't give grace or any of the other spiritual blessings that we're going to talk about. You can't give them by trying harder. You can't, you can't just decide you're going to do this more. You're going to have more faith. You're going to be more generous. You're going to be more kind. You can't just decide that. That's not enough. What you have to do is you have to dig deep in your heart with the Holy Spirit through Jesus. It is his gift of crap. That ca- it's his gift on Calvary. The gospel of Jesus that gives us the ability and, the, and the, just the, the, uh, the, the desire to bless and love on other people because of what he did for us. You can't do it in your own power. It is only because of Jesus and what he did for you on the cross and what he did for me on the cross that we are now able to give what people don't deserve because he gave us what we didn't deserve. This is not about, please hear me. Please hear me. This message on church is not about us being a better church. This is about us walking the way that God has ordained for us to walk as people who love him, who have no hope without him, and then to give that to people that don't have any hope because they don't know him yet. But that's our job. That's where we come in. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Father, Lord, we love you. Gosh, Lord, where would we be without your grace? Where would we be without your mercy? Father, I pray that as we leave here today, we won't just leave here thinking about grace, but we'll leave here looking for a way to give grace. That you'll put people in our lives, you'll bring people into our paths, Lord, that we can share your love, your grace with because of how you so lavishly poured it out on us. We love you, Lord. We worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can I bless you this morning as we leave? May the Lord bless you, keep you. May he watch over you and love you as the two of you walk together. May he pour grace upon grace upon grace upon grace that you can pour out on the people in your life for his honor and his glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Have a great, great Sunday.